are now listening to the Serious Growth Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. Hey, Bill, thanks for coming on. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Believe me. Um, I was just telling uh, Jason here that does all my make sure that this all happens. I said, I met you on you, you commented and correct me if I'm wrong, but you commented, I did a, a video. I think the title of the video was uh, you don't know what you don't know when it was about coming back from something because I came back from something and then you, you had a heart attack. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, just recently. Yeah. Just recently. So what did you give me? Okay. So why don't you tell, first of all, I'd like to know, where are you from? I'm from uh, East Northport, Long Island, New York. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm actually, though, because of the heart attack and a bunch of other stuff, I bought a house down in Florida, so Got I'm it. moving to Bonita Springs in, in okay. January. Uh, hopefully, Bonita Springs is out of the way of those damn hurricanes. Yeah, I know. We uh, we did get hit by the last one, but I wasn't there. They said it was, we didn't lose any electric or anything. I bought hurricane windows for my house. And yeah. Hopefully, I'll be okay. So people from New York, generally speaking, they spend quite a bit of time in Florida. Don't, don't you guys go there? To get yeah, some yeah, I like to go down to Florida. I love Florida. I've loved it since my parents brought me down there in 1963. It was I yeah. fell in love with it then, and I always wanted to move down there, but I had kids, and no one wanted to move. And now, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I, I've been to Florida a couple times. I was training a guy way back when, and he uh, he brought me uh, from California to train him for a while. This is when I kind of first started, and uh, so I haven't spent a lot of time. But I was in Miami uh, for sure. And I think it was Orlando, but you know, I, I'm like, other than that, I see the, the weather and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a scaredy cat of that hurricane stuff. And yet I live in California where we're like next, you know, they've been telling us that the earthquake's going to send us into a split, yeah. the, split the, uh, the state. So I don't know. I guess it's whatever you get used to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the house I bought, I guess all the houses now made it cement houses. They have, yeah. bank, you know, quadruple anchored roofs uh yeah. you know, everything's i get like i said i have the hurricane windows instead of shutters yeah so it's, well, it's, yeah i think it'll be okay <laughs> well i i'm thinking i'm happy for you that you're getting to go down to a place that you uh, that you've always wanted to go yeah semi-retire i'm going with my girlfriend and uh, nice. we're gonna split everything up and so i can cut back a little bit on my work because i work yeah. so many hours what kind of work do you do if you don't mind me asking I manage a, a community center. I've been here 20 years. I was a manager for 20 years up here in a, in a Sid Jacobson JCC. It's, uh, you know, it's in uh, Roslyn, uh -huh. and, uh, it, in Roslyn, New York. It's, you know, it, it's good, but COVID killed us. It just absolutely that killed right. us. And now that that is cool. are back, it's mostly teenagers that are here. Oh, okay. So the community center isn't a place like it's not. A, it's not like for seniors, right? It's just a community center for different age groups. Is that right? Yeah, it's a community center for anybody in the community. It's uh, you know, there's a lot of seniors and there's a lot of kids here now. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, the 30, 40s, and 50 year olds blanked out of here. I don't know where they are. You know, if they're yeah. training now or whatever they're doing, they found a new way of life because we were yeah. close for long. You know, yeah. with COVID. So, you know, it's been tough, you know, before the COVID, before it happened, uh, I had uh, a year, of, which is good up here because we're not the most expensive gym in the world. I, I made $820,000 in personal training money well, that's you know, personally in my group. And, yeah. uh, you know, when we came back, it was like $180,000. Oh, yeah. You know, with COVID was one of the things that just impacted everybody to some degree, yeah. you know? Yeah. I know during that time, I, I re, you know, I've been around for a long time in the industry, so I'm hard to scare that way. But uh, when they came out and told told me that I was going to have to close, I said, no, nah, I don't think so. You're going to have to drag my ass out of here uh, yeah. feet first, you know. So I never closed, but it did impact. I mean, it cut, you know, 50 percent of our business for a while, you know. You're back now or it's. it's yeah, going. it's all it's all back. Oh. In, fact, in fact, during that time, I mean, after I lost, you know, 50 percent people just were either gone or they just really stayed closed for a lot longer. So there was a few months there where I actually was busier than ever, um, you know, but it wasn't without having to deal with health department and cops coming in and, you know, uh, with social media. Now I had people that are coming on social media. Why is that place still open and raising hell with me? You know? So yeah, it was trying times for everybody. Wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. We had the, really go by the book yeah and they're, they're very 
skittish here. They didn't want to, you know, right. offend anybody, I guess. So for a while, when we opened, we had, everybody had masks on. I don't know if you ever trained. I don't know if you trained with a mask on, but never, you know, if you train hard, that's a tough one. You can't, it's hard to do, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope, I hope we never have to deal with something like that again, because that was the weirdest two or two years that I have been through. And I just kept saying, I, I never would have thought I would have seen the things that I've seen and still do uh, with what people, what happens when people get scared out of their minds, you know, it's really yep. weird. Yeah. So why don't you tell me, um, Bill, well, how did you get started in uh, weight training and did it evolve to bodybuilding? First of all, how did you get started in weight training? Okay. First, I, uh, I played sports when I was young. I was in high school in 10th grade. and um, I was playing football and I was only 140 pounds at five, seven. And I was getting banged around, you know, so I tried to get bigger. So I hung out with the linemen on the school team yeah. and they force fed me to the point where I was so sick. I would go to physics, like <laughs> ready to get sick, you know, right. and yeah. 10 pounds that way, but I didn't gain any height and I didn't gain any, uh, you know, uh, I don't even know if I was gaining muscle. I wasn't really working out back in those yeah. days. I'm 67 years old back in those days weight training you know we did it as football players but not not like we not like you do now it's funny that you say that i'm i'm your same age and as you're so right i mean the people that were in the weight room were the uh were the linemen uh, i was a i played quarterback back in those days okay. if i got near that if i got near that weight room oh i had hell to pay you know what yeah. i'm talking about they would put it put us down for using weights oh you're gonna get too tight you know? right well, exactly you know that. And then of course, you know, you know, fast forward now years, you know, now everybody's doing it in every single sport because yeah. that creates the competitive edge. But I will say this, you know, in some ways back going back to those, those times it's probably good in a way that they kept us out of the weight room because you know what, you can ruin somebody and you can create like what happened with most people back in those days, at least with, with in our weight rooms during my, when I was in high school, they were just doing a straight strength program, sets of five, five sets of five. Yeah. Well, as an athlete who's trying to excel on the field, we know that 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 doesn't always work because you're making somebody stronger but slower. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, without a doubt. So in yeah. some ways, maybe it was a kind of a good thing, you know, but, uh, oh, yeah, I didn't get into the gym for the first time until I was 25 years of age. Oh, wow. God. Yeah, I was, I was getting married, and I thought I wanted to get in, in shape. Hell, I went to a Jack Lane uh jim and oh, yeah. i didn't know what the hell i was doing i had to learn the hard way you know type thing. Yeah. interesting stuff that you know it's hard for i tell people now like even with personal training when i started personal training 40 years ago in my town this is a smaller uh town there's about a hundred thousand people now but back 40 years ago it was thirty thousand baby or something like that right and nobody even knew what the hell a personal trainer was when i first went out they go are you a aerobics instructor they didn't know I had to educate people about personal training. Of course, now there's somebody on every corner and then and on the internet, forget about it. Yeah. It wasn't as popular back then. It was like, almost like when Starbucks opened up and people say, I'm not paying that much for right. coffee. Yeah. People, Why would I need to pay for a personal trainer? You know, exactly. Exactly. You know, so it's been for me. Cause I, I just kept hanging in there. It's been a great life for me. I really, it's something I love doing. It's something I do every day. You know, if I don't do, do this on to some degree every day, I'm not happy really, but yeah. just to, this goes to show you how much things change. Okay. So you got into this, uh, yeah. with alignment and then when did it click to you to go to bodybuilding? Well, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband was, uh, in the army and, he went there as, you know, fairly skinny guy. And when I saw him, pictures of him, they were he's stationed in Germany. He was doing curls with a barbell, like with probably like 25s on each side. And his yeah. arms got huge. So, you know, when he came home for a leave, he would set me up and he'd say, you know, because I had barbells, but I never used them. Right. My house, my father bought them for me. And he would say, you know, let me show you some stuff. And then I went and bought a bench and stuff. And he would show me some stuff. And we went to the health food store and we bought the Bob Hoffman. Oh, yeah. I remember that. And protein powder, the 70%, whatever it was. Yeah. And, uh, I had, he had me drinking those drinks and working out and eating more. And uh, anyway, all of a sudden I started growing. You know, yeah. I was off football. And I started growing and I grew so much the first year, as you know, you know, yeah. bodies, 
like a sponge in the beginning. Exactly. Um, I, I, uh, I got really big and it got so big that I was growing out of my clothes. So my mother went, we went to the store and we bought, cause that, she kept buying me baggy, baggy stuff. Right. And we went to the store and she said, well, let me, you know, show up your build now. She said, so we went to the store and I bought tight shirts and, you know, good pants. I walked into school. People like, were <laughs> those weren't loose clothes before then. They were right. made. Big exactly. guy. Yeah. So how old were you at this point? Well, actually grew in height too, I guess, because I was drinking so much milk and whatever. I don't know. So how but, old were you at this time, at this point? Uh, I was 15 to 16. I went, okay. I was six years old. It yeah. was an age of, you know, I turned 16 and, and uh, it, I just got, I gained so much muscle. It was, you know, crazy the first year. I thought it was going to be like that the rest of my life. I thought it'd be right. Mr. Three years, you know. Oh, I know. Yeah, we so we wish that we wish that all the stuff that we do is it has a linear effect, but it sure doesn't, does it? Yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot of a lot of reps and sets you got to do. At the yeah. end of the day, it never ends. Actually, you know. Hit that wall where you know you didn't grow anymore, but you know, I was, at that point, I was pretty big. Yeah, and like I said, much better in football. I started to grow in height too, and everything. So yeah, so you were still playing sports at, at still at this age of twenty, like you were. All right, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our product. Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief and the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was, and uh, so then, then from that point on, you know, uh, I went to college after that, and uh, I went to a, my father sent me to a school, it was for accounting, and St. Bonaventure it was, and I, I go in there for a tour, and they had a, all they had was a, a universal machine with no, oh, oh my, and I was like, it, it was rusted, oh. and I and I was working out like mad in my house, that old gym in my yeah. house. Yeah. And I had to go because he sent me there. So right. I, I went down to the, the uh, university center to this rusty old uh, universal. I had to take the pin out of my door so I could use it in the machine, universal machine. <laughs> how to work. When there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> What's that? When there's a will, there's a way. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, got a park, not a park bench, but I got a bench I found somewhere in in the junkyard yeah. and use that for the bench press. And I did standing presses, you know, the universal machine, yeah. of course. Yeah. 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 So uh, anyway, so I did that for a while. And one day I'm working out in there and I hear like climbing, like weights climbing, like Olympic yeah. weight. Yeah. <laughs> like all excited. And I'm running through this huge university center. And finally I find the room where there's barbells everywhere, benches, squat racks. And I'm like, Oh my God. They had a gym here. I didn't even know about it. You oh know? My. So I walk in to work out and the guy goes, where are you going? And I said, I want to work out. And he goes, no, this is for the track team. Now they only had, they had no football team there. So the track yeah. team, you know, shot putters and everybody. Yeah. And I said, oh my God, I can't work out. And they said, no, unless you join the track team. I said, how do I join the track team? I said, <laughs> so they told me who the coach was. I went to the forum and he said, what, what events do you do? I said, uh, all of them. <laughs> He's like, well, <laughs> decathlon, what do you mean? Yeah. So I told him, I'll, I'll try anything. I said, you know, I didn't want to sound like I just wanted to work out. Right. So he goes, you really don't want to be here. He said, so whatever. So he, he told me, look, you know, I got all track guys here. No one else has asked in the university to work out. And yet I'll let you work out. And he, only when they're there, though. Yeah. So I worked out when they were there and it was great. I started, you know, making progress, strength and everything. And then um, I was like, you know, they, my schedule and their schedule wasn't meshing. 
So actually the guy that was running it said, here, I'll give you the key. But it's a key that says it can't be duplicated. You have to go to this state trooper guy that lived up, you know, way upstate. And so I drove all the way upstate. The guy made the key for me. They called him up and everything like that. And then I had a key. And so from that point on, I was, you know, in, in heaven. You were, yeah, you were experiencing way back when I call it perfect willingness. You know, you have yeah. to have perfect willingness in life for the things that you love, right? Exactly, exactly. You were sure. I would have gone anywhere, but you know, back I, then it was gyms. Yeah. You know, I was upstate in a place where there was no people, you know. Was, right, right. It definitely didn't have gyms, you know. It was crazy. Hey, like, I was actually going to bring my weights up there, but, you know. What, whatever, whatever it takes. You know, when I, when I, uh, when I was first training at my gym, when we, this is how much I was into it. I never wanted to miss a workout ever for any reason. So when we went on a, like a little three day vacation, I was like stressed out because I, I didn't, you know, I could have gone to the gym, but I just wanted to make sure I put dumbbells in the back of my, my car, my, my, my family, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cause come hell or yeah. high water, I was going to do a damn workout. That's yeah. just what it was. It sounds like, it sounds like your mentality. Yeah. 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 You're nuts. yeah. yeah. I, 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 yeah, but it's I also, did bring my barbell <laughs> up there with the big. They weren't even. They were standard plates, but there was a fifty pound plates. Yeah, I put them up there with the fifties and a few other ones. Put them in my father's car. We drove up there. There you go. Nuts. And then my bedroom was as big as like a, a walk in big closet in a rich yeah. person. Like yeah. that. And my roommate was like tripping over the bar. <laughs> That's it was funny. crazy. And that is so funny stuff. I mean, I'm just totally related to what you're saying. All I could get from my first wife was this. Why can't you be normal? I thought I'd rather die than be normal at this stage of the game because the bug bit me, you know, yeah. it was over. I re I knew yeah. that th I, this was going to change my life forever and it did. But boy, I tell you what, if you don't have the right support group, they can't figure you out. You're sick in the head. You're something wrong with you. Why can't you yeah. be normal, right? And you say, I am normal. That's This is normal for a bodybuilder. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, as you're going along here, the, when was the, did you compete in any bodybuilding competitions? Finally, well, I, this, the guy, two of the guys in the track team, one guy was a javelin throw, one guy was a shot putter. The shot putter was really powerful. He would do front squats with 450 oh, and man. butt to the ground. He had huge legs, like yeah. Tom legs, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was like not a bodybuilder. He was an Olympic lifter. So right. we we were talking one time, and they said, "You want to come with us? We're going to Ohio to go into a AAU uh, Olympic lifting meet." And I said, "Yeah, okay." And they said, they, "And I was pretty built up at that point." They said, "Do you want to go in the bodybuilding portion?" And I said, "They have bodybuilding and weightlifting." He said, "Yeah, it's a whole day event." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my first show was the Mister Ohio competition. And I was in the teen class. I was 19. And I just wasn't ready. I was still too really thin. And I wasn't ripped enough. I mean, I was eating college food and stuff right, like that. Right. They were okay because they just had to keep their weight where, where it was. I had to be ripped, you know. Right, so right. I went down there and I got my door blown off. I didn't I didn't yeah. win in no place at all. But it was fun. And yeah. it was a spark to my bodybuilding. So I started when I was 19. I vented shows for six decades. No you kidding. Know, well, I said because of my heart attack, but uh, it, it's it's been great. So anyway, so that's how we and we kept going to shows even after college or when college was over, like you know, in uh, I guess we were going in May, April, May, and we'd go to summer shows together. You know, I'd still meet up with these guys because they lived on Long Island, also. Yeah. Uh, we'd go to the summer shows, and I went to one in Erie, Pennsylvania. Did all right, but not great. You know, and I kept growing and getting into the sport more and more and more and uh by the 80s i started to get really into the sport you know and yeah. in a lot of different ways good and bad no i understand hey listen how did you like with me back in those days to learn how to uh, train as a bodybuilder you know it was much different until i think it was 83 when the internet happened or something i forget what it was in the 80s sometimes but up to that point it was like i, I had my nose in in bodybuilding magazines constantly you know 
So yep. I learned that way. But as you know, I mean, you, you know, you could sit at, you could have six different people telling you how to put on muscle and they were much different. It, it, you, I, t- I tell people, you know, something, the, the important lesson that I learned about that is that bodybuilding is a process and you have to be willing to do the long game. If you think that you're going to get there in a year or two, ain't going to happen, you know? Wow. And that separates the boys from the men in that in that particular sport. Even if you're taking drugs, it, it does. I mean, it's yeah. going to take you a long time, you know? No. So d- did you just learn this pretty much on yourself, or did you get with somebody at some point? Right. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, I, I was doing everything by myself, and I just kept losing. Yeah. So I decided I, – I, I, I went to a gym finally. I was training at home, believe it or not. And I finally went to a gym, and it was Future Man Gym, Julie Levine's gym in, um, uh, where was it, Amityville. And uh, I met up, I met these guys that were built well, you know, John Defendus. I remember uh, that name. I think yeah, I remember John that name. Defendus, uh, Wayne Alonzo, and uh, oh God, what was the other guy's name? Uh, oh, I can't think of the other guy's name. He's a very good bodybuilder, too. And we all worked out together, all four of us, you know, for yeah. a day, but for a while we did. And then John left the gym. John Defendus left the gym and he went to Mr. America's gym. And one day I'm in a, sh- I'm watching a show. I think it was 78 or nine. And I'm in the audience and here comes John out on stage as a teenager. Yeah. He must have gained 70 pounds of muscle. Wow. Look like wow. must have huge. He won the open the metropolitan. And and the and won the teenage and the open metropolitan competition. Yeah, May. So I said, "What is what is he doing?" Yeah, yeah. Stupid. I didn't know drugs and that from anything. And I went, I went to a uh, sorry, I went to a. uh, I I, they told me he's at Mister America's gym. So I go there. One of my friends was there. I go there and I was watching Steve train all the time. Steve Mahalik, and he would do like seventy five sets of body part. Yeah. One day. Pulled him aside. I said, "Steve, I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I, mean, I don't think I first of all could do seventy-five sets of body part, and isn't that overtraining?" He said, "No, you can never overtrain. You can only undereat." He said, "And those guys eat all day, like yeah. all day, like six chickens a day or whatever." Yeah, yeah. I still didn't do his workout. My friend did, and he, my friend, grew really well. But you know, also they had other things they were doing, and uh, yeah. but I learned a lot while I was there. Because Steve, you know, the, the way they train, just by sure. the way they Yeah. And, you know, the, like you said, there's there are different ways to train. If you're, I came up through the days of Mike Mincer. I'm sure you remember him. Heavy duty. I just work out. Yeah. yeah. I met him at a show and I started doing his uh, style of workout. And so I've tried it all. And I, I, I tell you this, the, go, going back to that comment about there's no such thing as overtraining, but he said you're under eating. I think there's a lot of truth to that. The When I was in Bulgaria, one of the things that they talked to me about, because they they trained their athletes, it was Olympic lifters, they trained their athletes five times a day. It was very short, uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah. But they would do, uh, uh, you know, uh, their point was this. They said, it's impossible to overtrain your your physiology in 45 minutes to an hour, no more than an hour. So if you don't overtrain your body to begin with, what's the problem, you know? So I took that to heart. So my style of training has always been do as much work because I started learning that uh, the heavy-duty stuff, even though it works for some people, yeah. If you know physiology, you know that the way it, it's adapting in that uh, very low uh, volume. And by the way, a lot of these guys that we're talking about, they were did like one or two, three or four sets. <clears throat> they weren't being upfront and and honest about that. I know that Dorian Yates, when you really looked at, because I, I was at the gym when he was training, or Mincer, uh, these guys always did a little more volume that they claimed. It was just that that was their thing that they made money off of, to be right. honest. Right. Uh, so I learned about that volume was the way to put on muscle as, you know, so that guy doing 75 sets, that doesn't surprise me. You know, yeah. the, key, the key is that as long as you keep promote, uh, keep your body from overtraining, if that means you eat more to help that, that matter, that's, that's the key right there. As far as I'm concerned. So it worked for them. Yeah. And I did the Mike Mentzer workout. And yeah. all I got from that was I didn't get any bigger. I did exactly what he said in his book. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get bigger, but I got stronger. I did right. get stronger. And that's, that makes sense because your physiology, it, when you're doing something for like where you're getting really strong, 
your body is in that rep scheme. It's adapting to that particular environment. You're going to get strong first and you might, as a, as another benefit, you might put on some muscle. Same way happens when you do a lot of reps, you're going to put muscle first, but you're also going to get stronger along the way. And if you're a bodybuilder, you want to put on muscle bass. That's right. That's right. So I tried both ends and yeah. I'm not extreme like Mahalik did because I can never eat like that. Right. I don't know if I'm, I always had a job or school right. or something, but um, you know, so that's, uh, so from that point on, I, you know, then eventually a gym opened up in my, my area and I started training there. It was called Sturge's gym. It was in Comac. I, I lived in East Northport where I live now. Yeah. And we all started training there. And it was funny too, because I was, I don't know if you know, Jimmy Quinn, but I was, uh, like the biggest guy in the gym. And then one day we look out the window and a taxi pulls up and here comes Jimmy. Quinn. Oh man. <laughs> he comes in to join the gym. I'm like oh boy <laughs> i think i think i know who that guy was he about like a six four six this kind of tall guy yeah, he, was like he was a football player originally got hurt he played for uh texas a&m or something did and he, did he go out to train at gold's venice yeah he was in the w uh, B, BF or b yes yes yeah. Yes, I, I met him. I went to. Um, I wanted to. This is when I met Tom Platts. As a as a result, I wanted to go to those Feebos. Have you heard of those Feebos in Europe? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And I had just written. I think it was. Uh, I don't know if it was Serious Growth or Big Ben Blake, one of those books. And I wanted to meet uh, Tom Platts. I know that he went there. I got on a damn plane, not knowing where the hell I was going, except for the country I was going to. Right. And uh, Jim Quinn was on. He was on that plane. There were about five pros. They were on that plane. I had their ear for about 10 hours, baby. Yeah. I, I met them all. You know, I was just like in heaven. You know, it's it's, it's kind of silly being my age and, and being all gaga. But uh, I didn't know where I was going. We get off the, off the plane. I was just following these guys. So kind of way back. So they didn't think I was a creep or something. And guess who picked up those damn pros? Tom Platts. That's, oh how, I met, that's how I met Tom. And wow. he, could tell, he could tell that I was lost, obviously, because he goes, hey, you need to ride somewhere? I just said, yeah, uh, wherever you guys are going. That's, that's, a hotel I, that's a hotel I stayed at. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm going to this FIBO. He have any tickets? I said, no. Can I get some? He said, no, but I'll give you some. He got me tickets. Wow. And the, the rest is history because while I was there, I told Tom I wanted him to come on and be a part of Serious Growth because he was famous. Mm -hmm. And I was a nobody. And that's how Tom and I started working together. He said, I, in one year, because I'm in the contract with Jim McMahon, he goes, I'm going to give you a call. I'm thinking, yeah, right. He just blowing me off. In one year, he got with me, and we did the whole thing together, man. It was an awesome ride with Tom. He's a good guy, Tom. I never met him, but I heard he was a good guy. He is excellent. He was so good for the sport. He taught me how to how to handle big, large amounts of people because when you go somewhere with Tom Platts, there's a lot of people that want to want to be around him. Wow. You know, even to this day, I mean, the guy's very charismatic and he was just really good for the sport. That was one of the things I'll never forget about that. And Tom was a good guy. He still is. Yeah. Did you ever meet Arnold? Oh, yeah. So, so Tom and Arnold were good buddies. and We smoked cigars together. I had I had a really great time during the golden era of bodybuilding with Arnold. I met so many people and we hung out and I'll never forget that. It was sp something pretty special. I think it gets more special as we get older, right? There is, yeah. You know what now, I mean? Now that I quit bodybuilding, I look back and I can only I I, I watch more of the the seventies uh, and sixties yeah. body. Stuff. I'm yeah. not in. Not that I'm not into that. What's going on now? It's just that it's, it's a whole different animal. It, it's a whole different ball game now. You know. It's, it's like I yeah. don't know how to get big. Right, it's, and I'll tell you somebody somebody else that I met that that put my hair on the back of my neck. It like stood up because of how this guy was Robbie Robinson. Yeah. I did a seminar at my gym that I have right now and I brought him in. Yes. Uh, I saw it. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. That was one of the most unique things that I've ever seen. This guy is the walking embodiment of somebody who lives the bodybuilding lifestyle. He's a monk oh. and Everything, even the way he sets himself up to do an exercise. I was going, holy shit. I've never seen anything like this. He has, his cadence, his rhythm. It was just, it, it blew my mind. It was, it was crazy stuff. But yeah, I agree with you, by the way. I think that during that time is a lot of, a lot of special people during that era. Anyway. Okay. So let's, let's get, uh, let's get to the point now where you're, 
um, you're on stage, you're competing now. Uh, any particular um, competitions stand out uh, from you or for you? Well, uh, I competed a lot in the 80s. And my biggest one back then was the Mr. Long Island yeah. in 87. Uh, I was once again hanging out with Jimmy Quinn. And a matter of fact, before that show, you know, I wanted to get as big as I can possibly get. You know, it was about maybe a year and a half before that show. And he goes, I'm going to take you around and we're going to eat. And I'm going to show you how to eat. So, yeah. And we went to like 10 places to eat. And it was, yeah, it was just, I, I was so stuffed. I couldn't. No, I understand. Much. You know, big to get big, he says. Well, and, um, you know, you as you know, if you want to get big, you have to be uncomfortable. I talk about that all the time. <laughs> It's not, yeah, it's not very comfortable to do this, the stuff that we like doing to be, especially when you're being big. So when did this happen now? Um, you've been in the, in the sport for a long time, uh, obviously, and, and bodybuilding. So you said you quit the sport. Did you quit lifting? Cause you don't look like you stopped lifting. Did you just quit competing? No, when I had the heart attack, when I had the heart attack, I was in the hospital for 12 days. I lost 20 pounds. Wow. Heart attack, and I'm still down. I'm only 213 now. My body weight usually is 230. Yeah. So I have a bunch of. Stuff. I just started, you know, working out again the last few weeks. Yeah. And I went. I've already improved or increased in a, a considerable amount. You know, it was. Uh, and I'm careful. I'm very careful. Yeah. It's just that was scary. Oh that. man. No. I thought I was gonna die, and they did. Yeah. They did. You probably should have died from this. And um, I. Uh, you know, I mean, slowly increasing my workout regimens and, you know, I'm like I work out a lot. So I've been doing more cardio now, too. Yeah. Even though, you know. what, what was the reason that you had the heart attack? Well, OK, let me go back to 2015. 2015, I won uh, the NPC um, 60 and over. I just turned 60, 60 and over heavyweight class of the Masters. I, I won it. And then in the overall, I didn't win some little guy that's, you know, 140 pounds ripped. Right, right, right. I was big, but I wasn't. Right. And shortly after that, I was, uh, I think I'm making a long story short here, but shortly after that, I was, uh, was, I was in a movie theater with my girlfriend. It was 2016. We were watching that movie, Concussion. And it, the last five minutes, I started getting these major chest pains. This is 2016, actually. Yeah. She, the movie always she turns over and she goes, what's the matter? I said, I don't know, my chest. I feel like the truck's driving over me. Yeah. So he runs to the hospital and they gave me an angiogram and they said that you have a, a very thick heart. A lot of weightlifters get this yeah. thick heart. My injection fraction was only 30 from a uh, you know, normal guy. is like 65. That's what yours might be. Mine was 30. And that's not even half of what it should be. Yeah. And uh, so they said, we're going to medicate you for six months, uh, three months. If it doesn't do anything, we are going to give you a pacemaker defibrillator because yeah. we should have a heart attack. So I, uh, they medicated me for actually six months and it just wasn't coming back. So they put a pacemaker defibrillator in, which I have. So yeah. if you see competition pictures from, I guess I started again in 2019, um, you'll see that big pacemaker yeah. because really ripped and more fairly ripped and right right lump sticking up on my chest where the the judges would look up at me like what <laughs> what, what body part is that <laughs> <laughs> never seen that muscle before yeah, no kidding. So, so they put that in me and I, it was okay and i went three years without competing and then i said you know what i can't do this anymore i want to compete again yeah you know the doctor gave me the okay she said sure you just got to be careful can't do certain things anymore yeah. So I said, okay. And I entered in 2019. I got two third places, one in the uh, Atlantic States and one in the universe, NPC. Yeah. And, uh, I got third in the universe. There's only three guys in my class. The guy yeah. that won the California in 1979. Okay. He was, uh, I forget what his name was. but And then uh, 2020 was COVID, so it, there was no shows. Right. 2021, I went back in again, and I did really well in 21. And then this year, I went in and I won the Atlantic States, which was my first show. And then I started. I, I mean, uh, at the universe, I was I got dead last in the show, dead last. Yeah. yeah. Something was going on in my body. I didn't know what it was, and I just couldn't get hard, no matter what I did. 
Yeah. I was starving myself and I, I just was smooth as anything. Yeah. And, um, and so when I, by the time I got to my last show, which was the nationals, I said, you know what? I think it's time to stop. I think something's going on in my body and I, yeah, I got yeah, a yeah. And that was in July. And then we went to Florida. My girlfriend and I bought the house and uh, came back and I just didn't feel right. People would tell me like, you look like something's wrong. You're like red in the face, you know? Yeah. Got to September, the end of September and massive heart attack. Oh. Okay. Massive. Like it was, yeah. I, not, like my heart attack, I got a heart attack. They put two stents in my heart. I was 100% blocked, 100% wow. blocked, two stents. And then um, I, I came out in recovery and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. And they rushed me back in the operating room and they opened me up and they found out that uh, I was bleeding internally. Oh man. Uh, the heart. I must have something, they must have done something. Yeah. They put tubes in me and I drained two liters of blood. Unreal. These, these boxes that they put on the floor. Yeah. Then uh, I got pneumonia in the hospital. Yeah. But this is it, man. This guy is going. Yeah. And that was bad enough. In ICU, they said, look, we have to put a monitor on you. So they put a monitor on me. And um, I was in the hospital bed. And the nurses came running into my room. They said, from my area. And they said, you know, you all right? And I said, why? Yeah. And they said, your heart's racing. You got AFib, like, beyond, like, what we've seen. They said, we got to shock you. And I said, whoa, oh. what? No, we're gonna knock you out. So they shocked me. So all that stuff happened to me. Unbelievable. Twelve days. And when I got out of the hospital, I was, I was just, uh, I, I couldn't walk five feet without being so out of breath. I couldn't even think. It's yeah. gotten better. I'm still, my breathing's still not perfect, but I feel good. Yeah. I feel good. I'm working that's, out. I mean, that's half the battle of just feeling good at this point. Yeah. And but I I'll think. So, and I think that. If I wasn't a fitness person, a workout person with cardio and weights, because I was doing a lot of cardio for the shows, yeah. I either might not have made it or it would take forever to come out of this thing. I, I totally agree with you. I think that you, I think I've, I've talked about it before. Bodybuilding saved my life in many ways. Yep. And, you know, I had those damn strokes and, you know, ooh, and I, I can, I mean, this gives me like the chills listening to you talk about this because i've talked about this you know when something like this happens to you what people don't maybe don't realize because it's hard to unless you've had something this close to death because right. you did and doctors told me i was lucky to be alive is that that terrorist lives inside my head to this day it's been 10 10 a little over 10 years and if i'm being honest with you it's always there now it doesn't it doesn't paralyze me because I keep, I, 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 I've talked about it before in the video. If I don't live my life as a bodybuilder to some degree, I have to make the changes. And I think that's one of the things I talked about in that video. I can't do the things I did in the same way, but that doesn't mean like I have to compete against myself on some level. Yeah. Otherwise I'm just flatlining and I don't know which one's worse to be honest, but that doesn't change the fact that that terrorist lives in my body, in the back of my head. And maybe it's a good thing. But I, I tell you what, it's a very hard thing to keep taking steps forward when something like that, that drastic happens to you. So I feel you, man. And I'm really proud of the fact that you're, you know, you're, you're still, you're hanging in there and you, you're not going to give in, you know, give up. And like you said, I got that same thing in my head now. It's like yeah. when I built a lot of muscle, I went from a stick skinny kid to build a lot of muscle. You got that muscle rexia where you, you feel like you're going to go back to that point. Right. You're afraid to go. You're right. afraid work out and eat right and stuff. exactly it's i know in some ways so like same thing with this it's a good thing in some ways but yeah then it's yeah so we we somehow have to figure out how to i keep talking about learning how to keep moving forward because life just keeps coming at us no matter right. what you know and if that's just the reality of that so uh there's a difference between just doing something without thinking about it but when you take a, a calculated risk it's a risk uh still you know but which one's the worst? I mean, I, I knew that if I didn't get back to some degree, like I don't want to compete anymore. I don't. But if I didn't get to some degree where I, I feel I feel good and I feel good when I'm competing against myself in the gym, uh, I would be in a bigger prison than you know, if I just said, well, oh, shit, I'll just I'll do nothing and just be, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can handle that, uh, Bill. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't. Yeah. No. It's, anyway. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> Well, listen, I'm glad that 
you know, it really meant something uh, to me when people respond to something I've said, because, you know, I've been in this industry for 40 years and, you know, you don't know sometimes how much you impact people, you know, like you yourself, you don't know that how much, you know, people see you as you know, an inspiration. And so when I see things like that, it really, it's humbling for me. And I appreciate those uh, nice words. It means, it means a lot that maybe I had something to do with you, you know, coming back and, and it's hanging in there. So I appreciate you, man. And I appreciate the fact that you and, I, I agree with just about everything you say. I mean, maybe everything you say, you know, it's, I love watching your, your podcast and stuff and, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for those uh, kind words and, and thanks again for coming on. Listen, if uh, something down the road happens, like, uh, like in a really good way for you, let's chat again. I mean, I'm man, one, one of the things that I, what I do in my life right now, as much as I can, maybe you can relate. I just try to do the things that I want to do. You know, if people like it, fine. If not, I'm right. having a good time, Bill. I'm having a good time here with you and talking about you. You got a great story. So uh, if you got some other stuff you want to talk about, don't right. ever hesitate to reach out. All right. Great. Thank you, Leo. All right. so yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you I soon. Really okay? All right. Yeah. Take care. Take care, Leo. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Serious Growth Podcast. For more episodes like the one you just listened to, subscribe to us on your mobile podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to reach out, you can find us online at SeriousGrowth.com. Until next time, train smart and train hard.